Good day, everyone. Well, uh, we see a continuation of the general market uptrend um, overall. Of course, the markets have had a little pullback here. The S&P uh, is about a little over 1% off its uh, peak price. But uh, the general uh, trend uh, remains intact um, for all these general markets. Um, we noticed that uh, the uh, the tech stocks are doing very well, and so that's uh, obviously bullish overall for the markets. If you look at something like, a, let's look at the uh, three three X ETFs like TECL, you'll see that uh, it it doesn't have two. Its pullbacks are very very mild. You know, compare that to, um, for instance, the triple uh, T triple Q, which is the three X Nasdaq 100 uh, ETF. And the pullback's a little more pronounced. And then if you go to something like um, what is it, SPXU, which is the 3x, uh, not not SPX, uh, UPRO rather, UPRO is the 3x S&P. Uh, the pullbacks are, uh, especially this one, are more more pronounced. So um, that that tells us that uh, going into the end of the year, um, it's likely that uh, these uptrends will remain intact, uh, despite. Uh, uh, it being a difficult environment all year to um, play in pyramid um, leading names for the most part, with with a couple exceptions like Tesla, um, it's been uh, it's been a very challenging year. And then, of course, on the trend following side, that's also been challenging, as um, uh, listeners will note uh, from uh, prior uh, recent um, pre market um, reports. Um, as far as uh, groups, we talked about uh, some of these. Um, these uh, uh, various um, Vegas stocks uh, like LVS, uh, Win, WYNN, um, Valleys. So it looks like there's uh, some uh, positive action going on in this group, and um, the overall industry group strength has improved uh, somewhat. Um, we also had some fiber op optic stocks that were uh, we were we, we were talking about to how um, some of these names look, look like they're um, still in a relatively uh, decent shape. They're rounding out their bases, and perhaps they're going to move back up to the 50-day moving average. So it's good to keep an eye on those. Um, and then, as far as uh, the big uh, big pharma stocks, uh, they seem to be still holding their ground, especially in, in relation to this uh, pullback, like uh, Celgene, CELG. Um, we also have uh, Biogen, who had the uh, gap up, and it's uh, having a pullback on lighter volume. Um, and then look at the Gilead, the GILD. Uh, that uptrend still looks uh, relatively intact. So uh, overall, we're uh, we're looking at the bullish side of things um, as uh, we uh, head into the end of the year. Gil? Uh, yeah, I'm with you, Dr. K. I think I'm pretty bullish right now, and I've been using the pullbacks over the last few days to be buying into stocks. Um, some of you on the chat room, you know, yesterday we were talking about uh, some of these uh, fiber optic names. Now, the interesting thing about fiber optics is that most, like the vast majority of, of Internet traffic and network traffic in the U.S., I believe, is still going through copper wires and so there's still this need to transition over time to fiber optics. So you, I think these names have their phases. You know, these things have some decent moves. If you look at the weekly say on Sienna, for example, you had a pretty good move. I mean, you come off from a, around 17 bucks, you run up to 28, that's about 50%. Remember, these are mostly old names. They're not new, you know, hot new merchandise, merchandise like GoGo -Go is, okay? These are older names. They're going to be a little slower and so it seems like these things will run up and then correct, and so it has corrected, and it's round, trying to round out a base, it looks like to me. You notice you get some supporting action in, in here as you're coming down, uh, so but you're still trying to round out. To me, it's a little bit premature. You could say this is a, an attempt at a pocket pivot, but nothing happening yet. You look at Finisar, it's trying to round out. So I think these are stocks to keep an eye on. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're going to start ripping out of here, but they're names to keep an eye on. I think AFOP too. Uh, the problem with with uh, some of these is that there's a lot of a lot of small fiber optic companies out there that present competition for a company like like Alliance Fiber Optic, but the stock has you know had a big it had a big move here, so now you're rounding out a base. 
and it's possible you're very tight along here. Notice you're holding along the 150-day exponential moving average, interestingly, and so far it's been holding that level. And I, I would say if you're really feeling venturous, you know, you could come in here and and uh, try and buy a little bit of the stock. It's trading pretty thin right now, about what 900,000 shares, so not even you know 15 million in daily dollar volume. But it is uh, interesting the way it is holding tight along the lows here, and it could be trying to form the bottom of the base. So um, we've been getting some questions about these names because they are acting better. Juniper is probably leading the pack right now. You did have a pocket pivot, I believe. Let's see. No, it missed a pocket pivot by one day. But, you know, I don't know. In my view, it's like close enough for uh, horseshoes, hand grenades, and buying stocks in a QE market. Uh, you know, so, so the thing's starting to move off of this little flag in the 10-day moving average, and now it's coming up. That's what it looks like uh, here, sort of a sagging middle and the double bottom there. Uh, and a big V-shaped cup with handle. So, you know, these names are interesting. I like uh, I like what's going on. I, I think Facebook is trying to turn here. And, yeah, yesterday it got moving because, supposedly, because they're going to be added to the SP 500. And they sell it off this morning. In fact, last night I saw it go down as low as like 47, 60-something uh, after hours when they didn't make it on the SP 500. But, you know, I don't think that's a reason. Just because a stock is going to be placed on an index is not a reason to buy it. If, if there's rumors of that happening, but you also like the general price volume action of the stock, then I think that's that's the basis for buying it. The other thing is the theory here is that with the tech L acting relatively better than the rest of the market, we're seeing a rotation. This is what I think is happening. That's why you see the Dow coming off and the S&P coming off. You know, they're down 0.28 and 0.31% right now. The Nasdaq's only down 0.14. So, you know, we've seen a lot of these tech names pull back and correct Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, you might even throw Tesla in there. My suggestion yesterday on the chat room was that you could use a pullback here uh, to the 20-day and maybe buy a position with the idea that it could rally up into the 50-day uh, moving average. So, and the other thing is Tesla has had a big run, so it's entitled to build a big base, and maybe it's, that's what it's doing. So, uh, and you got to be open-minded about that. You would call that a pocket pivot type move off the bottom, but I don't know. Dr. K, do you think that's rounded off enough to be a bottom fishing pocket pivot, and do you like the position of that, or do you think it's possibly viable and worth a shot using a yeah. reasonable stop? Yeah, you got a lot of cross currents here. First, you got the gap down, and then um, it hasn't really had enough time to round out yet. Um, and, but on the other hand, you had a gap up two days ago on good news. So there, it seems like the pros and cons are weighing out. Um, you also have the pros of the market averages uh, rallying into year end. If that is going to happen, then uh, Tesla, given the backdrop of good news two days ago, it's probably going to rally up to at least its 50-day and maybe round out its base and then, uh, and then break out to new highs. So overall, that's all, all that is to say that I would be a buyer um, of Tesla if I had you know any... Uh, if, if I wanted to increase the uh, exposure of my portfolio to the market at this juncture, um, I might buy a small position of Tesla here. Yeah, I actually do have a, I guess what for me is a small position, but I, I think the stock has potential, and it's a risky trade, okay, but it's a trade, I think, and you've got a well-defined stop down at 136.41, which is where the 20-day is. So I'll take a little shot here, you know, I'll buy a small 50% position here and uh, see what happens. Uh, but, you know, some of the other stocks I like here, um, Splunk, I, I think coming down to the 10-day, maybe that's okay. It's, it's pushed up off of there. I think the Workday, you know, you had this movement straight up off the bottom of the base on a viable gap up, and we talked about this last week. I was actually shorting this, and I figured once it got to the 50-day in this era, zone here, you cover it and then maybe go long. And, of course, you had a, a pickup in volume yesterday above average, and it's trying to come off the uh, – 10 day here. It may base around for a little bit, but I think if you're going to step in on some of these things, this is kind of where you have to, to come after them. And if you are timid or if you get, you know, you get greedy on the one hand and then you get timid on the other hand, I think those are really bad emotions to have in this market. You can't really get greedy. When you've got something running up, you can sell, it should probably sell some of it. Of course, that's going to bring in you know, into question, what do I do with GoGo -Go now? You have this sharp run up here, and I thought, you know, that was, we talked about this about a month ago, and 
I thought it was uh, sellable into that move, and of course let it set up again. That's what I like to do. If I'm running it up, sell into this move, and then wait for it to uh, settle down. Now you could, if you bought the gap up, you never violated the low, never even got close to it. So you could have sat with it, but the way I run, most of you on the chat room know this. You know, I'll be heavy, heavy in a stock, and so I'm getting, I'm squeezing it for every drop it's got. And I might sell a little bit early, you know. I might sell before 30, and and then watch it go to 31, and I'll be ticked off, sure. But that's what stocks like to do, anyways. So you know, it has a little time here. The volume dries up along the lows, and then you're watching it here as the volume's drying up along the lows. And and as soon as it starts moving up on that news on Monday, getting above the 10-day, in my view, the thing becomes very actionable right at that point, and you don't have to sit around and wait. To see if you're going to get pocket pivot volume or not. In fact, my feeling is it wouldn't even matter to me. I wouldn't need to even see a pocket pivot because what I'm already seeing is a nice, a lot of strength initially, and then a pullback that is orderly for this stock. You know, it does swing around 20% or so, but it is a smaller, more volatile stock, so you give it, you know, a lot of swinging room. Uh, looks a little seismographic there, and, and then it, it dries up, and then you see that happening. And once you start to see it get above the 10-day, now you have a reference point that it should hold above uh, in the event of a, uh, you know, in, in the event this move fails. But, uh, you know, you're watching it just living under the 10-day moving average. As soon as it pops above, you come after it, and boom, it's up there. And you've got, you know, 20% in it and nothing flat. And to me, that's a great way to operate. But you, you do have to be a little bit anticipatory, and you do have to be decisive, and you have to act when... You see things happening and not need, you know, everybody always wants certainty in the market, so you're going to sit around and wait to see if there's a pocket pivot. You know, people always ask us, well, how do you know when, when you can buy the pocket pivot, you know, earlier, earlier in the day? It's like, well, you don't know for sure, okay? And that's the uncertainty of it. For all I knew, if I was buying this thing on Monday right here, popping up, it could have failed and rolled over. But had it done that, I probably would have been gone pretty quickly. You know, and then watch for a test of the 20 day, or maybe even it just goes sideways, the 50 day catches up. So, you know, you're looking at different scenarios, but once you start to see what you're looking for already, so if I'm looking for that, I'm acting on that right away. And I'm not sitting around looking for someone else to tell me whether it's okay to do it or what percentage of pocket pivots can you buy earlier in the day versus later in the day, as if there is one. And in any case, as far as I'm concerned, statistics don't really apply to individual stocks because they'll all do their own thing, and they all have their own unique character, in my view. And so you kind of got to have to get to know them. So, you know, that that's been a good stock. Um, the workday coming up. Taser is coming back into the 50-day moving average. Notice it's undercutting it, <laughs> and. Uh, what seems to be typical for a lot of stocks is you'll get, uh, they might even violate the 50 day moving average, but they'll find support at the 65 day. You know, Facebook has been pretty much like that. It just kind of undercut it and now it's back above it. It's been holding it mostly. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the thing pocket pivot back above the 50 day if the market continues rallying into year end. But um, going back to Taser now, you know, it's right on top of this prior flag here. And it looks to me, yeah, volume drying up today. Hey, Dr. K, what's the volume on Taser looking like? Minus 48%. So yeah. it's half a normal, right, for this time of the day. So it's drying up. Right at the 50 day. And, yeah, and that, that's kind of what you want, want to see. It's, it's right there. Dr. K, do you think you can step in and buy shares here, or does this weekly chart scare you? No, I, it looks uh, good to me because it is drying up nicely. And, yeah. uh, you know, with the, with the market, uh, with the winds uh, at its back because of the general markets going trending higher, uh, I think it's a viable spot right here. Yeah, I'm with that's you 100%. Of course. And, you know, you're, if it goes below yesterday's low, that's your 50-day violation, so you're out of it. Yeah, and it's pretty tight, uh, pretty tight. Or you could give it the, down to the 65-day if you want to give it a little more room. But my guess is it should hold the, the low of this gap here. And the top of this base, roughly, and and maybe the 65-day exponential moves up a little more. So if you wanted to give it a little more room, you could. But in my view, it's a pretty tight trade here, I think. And the other thing you're noticing, if you look at this weekly chart, what can uh, anybody tell me about this chart from this breakout? You had this nice breakout here, boom, took off, and uh, now you have a pullback, and it's the first pullback to the 10-week moving average. So, you know, you got to be all over this thing. And, you know, I sit underneath 16 and uh, just put it, bid, bid the thing over the last couple of days and let everybody sell it to me. 
and that's been nice so far. It's holding up okay, and I just keep getting my position at a nice price. And uh, you know, I, I think people uh, don't really see what's going on here and where the pullbacks are uh, in stocks. And I think that's really how you have to operate. But I saw yesterday's action on the indexes is pretty constructive. I mean, you had higher volume on the Nasdaq. You close off the lows of the day and slightly up. So you know that looks pretty good, doesn't it, Dr. K? Looks good to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so so you know, and with the rotation, we think you might be seeing back into things like Facebook, Tesla, LinkedIn, and a bunch of the techs and other names, and that would include Taser. We think you'll see this thing, you know, turn and go up. It's interesting as we're talking about it, it's pushing up about a nickel or so. Um, but you know, it, it, that's this is what you have to do, and this is the way you have to operate in this market. This is the way I've been doing it. And once they start to start to show strength, I'll sell into that and cut my position back. And I'm doing, uh, I haven't my best year since uh, I'm going to say what what probably 2001 when I was up 163 percent, mostly on the short side. So I'm already doing better than 2004 when I was long just Apple and Google in 100% positions each and they were running. So that technique has worked. Pyramiding is uh, is a fool's game in my view and it's just the nature of this market. Um, and so you have to be more active and you have to be willing to be decisive uh, when the market's coming at you in your face and it looks like things are going to get ugly. And if you've been short, uh, as I've been a few times, you know, even playing stocks like worked, I was shorted off the peak because I thought that was a shortable gap up based on the fact that it came straight up off the lows and into the the resistance area on the left side of the chart. You know, I play it to the downside, it hits my target, and I turn and I go long. And so I don't have an opinion about where the stock is going and whether I need to be bullish or bearish and stamp it on my forehead, okay? Uh, just got to be flexible and just move with the market. It's, I mean, it's like a dance, it feels like sometimes. I mean, some people want to get frustrated and call it a Q, QE market and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I know a lot of people complain on the chat room. We see some of that. We see some emails from people having a rough time. But it's a dance. And either you know how to dance with it or you don't or you're just a clumsy dance partner. Um, that's the way I look at it. Anyways, what else? I mean, everything's moving here. Look at the, the solars uh, coming up. I like the positions here. Notice the 20-day exponential is, is uh, support. The sun power is hanging in there. Uh, what are the other ones that we uh, like in this group, Dr. K? Um, oh, first solar. Did I push that one up there? Yeah, notice also it's holding along the 20-day. The I wouldn't be surprised to see these, these things turn and go higher. Uh, here's a weekly chart on first solar. You just came out of this big, giant uh, double bottom, and so here you are. Basically, this pullback to the 20-day also coincides with the pull to the top of the base here. See that? I mean, it could come in a little further, but it looks to me, based on the tight closes, that it wants to go uh, higher. So from here, and it'll come off the 20-day. That's what it looks like to me. I mean, if I was going to take a trade here off the 20-day line, you know, I probably would use a pretty tight stop, like 59 possibly, maybe even 59. Give it a buck, you know. I don't know. Because I, I think it should move from here. Volume is light today, and they're they're all holding up pretty well. Um, let's see, LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn, I'd watch it here. Possible uh, pocket pivot move. You know, the thing with LinkedIn is it could be this really bizarre-looking double bottom. Okay, you do have a V. You're coming down. This is your first week down, so you're actually four weeks down on the left side of the of the W, rather not a V. Well, it, that's parts V, but the W is two Vs put together, right? Anyways, uh, you're five weeks down uh, at this point, and that's what you want to be. When you want to, when you're seeing, looking at a double bottom formation, you, it needs a little time to kind of work its way through. So. You need to see, uh, in my view, three to five weeks. You know, a lot of people will show you a, a pattern with two weeks down on the left side of a double bottom. That's not enough, in my view, to kind of shake things out and get everybody out. So, you know, you're looking at this thing, and you've got a double bottom. You're holding in here, kind of triangulating, getting a little bit tight in here, uh, which looks looks good to me. It looks like it might try to come off, and it, you know, it makes sense. You'd have a big, ugly base. That's what LinkedIn did last time. It's looking pretty grim right around here. Uh, back in May, like it was topping, then it turned around and came out. So the key thing here to watch for is uh, a pocket pivot off the 10-day. But notice you got selling volume in the pattern in general is starting to dry up here. You've already undercut the lows here, so you're in a position uh, to go higher. You know the way the way I, I guess 
you haven't seen any undercut on Tesla, but you do notice it came all the way back to this supposed high tide flag here in the 200 day, the 40 week, and that's again, you're, you're not hitting it exactly, but you're getting close enough, which in my view, in a QE market, you know, close enough for hand, uh, hand, uh, hand grenades, hydrogen bombs, and QE markets, so that, that works for me. Um, oh, and don't forget horseshoes, but anyways, let's see. <sighs> What's your favorite stock in this market right now, Dr. K? Do you have one? <laughs> Well, in terms of risk reward, I love Taser because you know your risk is two percent, and it's a very um, uh, aggressively uh, upside aggressive stock. So you know it's had a great uptrend <laughs> and then it had a gap up on earnings. So it's got all the wins at its back. So you know that what we just talked about, I think it's a fantastic uh, buy point. Yeah, I, I think so too. So <clears throat> we're up another thirteen cents here on the stock. Okay, let's see it. Let's go to some questions here, and if anything else comes to mind. Xerox. Uh, I don't know why anybody would buy Xerox. That's my view there. My, it's like there's so many other good stocks in this market. Why would you screw around with Xerox? Uh, so that you know, find, I think you take to sell Xerox by Taser. How's that? All right, a Aris. Uh, well, you know, this stock was in IBD uh, last night or in today's paper, which came out last night. Uh, for those of you who get it via PDF. And uh, the, I guess the EIBD, as it's called. Um, you know what's interesting? I'll tell you a little story about that. But you remember Dr. K back? It was like, I think, in 98. And Bill uh, asked us, you know, what do you think? What, they were asking for suggestions about the paper. And Dr. K and I, at the time, we were getting news feeds off of Google. And it's like 99% of the news and everything we were getting was being streamed to us from the Internet. So we were kind of ahead of the curve on the technology there. And we both told Bill, well, you know, obviously an electronic edition of the paper, you know, people get information off their computers now. This is the new world. Remember, Bill was a guy who said, you, you said this, Dr. K, at a, at a conference, he said the Internet was a fad back in the early 90s. Well, right? it, it, very early on. And, I mean, when uh, he woke up was really uh, 1996. Well, that was still a year ahead. In 1996, yeah. he was questioning if the internet is really going to be valid, if it's really going to be a major force. So that was in 1996, the uh, very early in that year. Right. By 1997, he had changed his view um, in real, well, with Netscape and things actually earlier than 1997. When Netscape started trading, he bought Netscape right. and he made money on it. So right. he was very, very quick and flexible to change his viewpoints. Right, exactly. So, but at the time, you know, the whole idea of having an EIBD is a little kind of lukewarm and it took him a while to get it going. but. I like to think that Dr. K and I were involved in some of the initial input on that. And that was just based on our own experience. I'm sure a lot of you have let the same thing happen. But, you know, I would see this more as an exhaustion gap, not in a short term. I don't necessarily believe it's the end of it for the stock. Here's a breakout from a cup with handle. That's not a bad breakout. It's run up pretty quickly. So this is probably short term an, an exhaustion gap, and maybe it needs to go sideways. So if you're, you know, worried about, you know, like the old saying goes, you never know how rich you are until you start making a little money. So you start worrying about a stock more when you're making a big profit on it. And you don't want to see that disappear. You could sell half and see if it sets up, you know. Take the what I call my go-go approach, which is sell into the big move, let it set up again, and then come back into it when you can have more conviction about what's going on with the stock. Anyways, Microsoft, somebody said they let Microsoft uh, shake you out. That's okay. Take the money, shake you out. You know, but this is what I'm talking about. I and I, I think uh, listen to what I'm saying here. You're getting a rotation out of these doggy names that have been leading the market to new highs recently. Okay, and you're getting rotation back into some of these tech names that have either been building new bases, or you know, languishing, running up a little bit. You know, like the Splunk on the breakout. I think even some of the biotechs um, are looking okay. So what you do is you lose this piece of garbage and you buy something like a Taser. Um, that's what I would do. I would sell it all, but that's just me. Con, uh, you got a buyable gap up here. Uh, it, it is running into some resistance on the left side of the pattern. That looks normal. They had a big earnings announcement uh, today. So your low here is 64.20. You're trading 66.94. So you ask yourself, if I buy a position here, am I okay with the risk? Because I might be stopped out at... Uh, you know, 6420 or maybe even 63, you know, if you're giving it some uh, porosity or some leeway on the downside. 
in layman's terms. Uh, A lot of questions on ARRS, ARRS. Twitter base after five weeks. Twitter, rather, sorry. Um, it's getting a little bit of a, a IPU turn sort of look, yeah. So it's it's starting to turn. This stock could still have a big move, you know, but as we like to say, and you know, we say this all the time, but we're not dumb enough to buy stocks on the first day of the IPO. I mean, that's, that's just greed. Got a hold of your mouse button there and clicking away and making you buy the stock on the first day. I mean, you're just set up to lose money. But maybe this thing is trying to set up. It, to me, it's you know, it's it's looking a little premature. But let's see. If you got a pocket pivot, I don't see the 10 days down there closer underneath 42. So on the daily chart here, let's try to blow this up a little bit. See, it looks more coherent that way, doesn't it? But here, let me, so so there it actually looks pretty good. But let me do this. Ooh, now that looks too weird to buy, doesn't it? But if I do this, oh, that looks much better. Look at that. Oh, I want. I'm all. Look at how tight it's getting now. Look at that. Anyways, uh, all right. That's a little chart visual there. Chart humor. Anyways, it's basically doing this. Here's your 10 day. So you came off uh, yesterday, and you know, I don't know. I've seen some five day pockets work. You know, in other words, it's the highest uh, volume higher than any down volume over the prior five days. And I've seen some of those work in uh, instances in hot stocks uh, in this market. So another QE weirdness you know, thing to throw you off. But it, it's, it might, might be setting up, sure. So you, know, you could buy maybe on the basis of yesterday's pocket pivot, 4150 is your stop, I guess, if you're all hot for it. But like I said, why, why do I need that? I got other things. Bit auto. Um, you know, it's just pulling back. Nothing really exciting here. Either way, volume drying up looks constructive. Spewer rounding about. Well, that's what I was talking about. Uh, it's actually held. Notice it violated the 50-day here, but not on a closing basis. But did hold above the 65-day exponential, roughly. But you know, moving averages are all just fuzzy zones. I was joking the other day, and what do you think of this idea, Dr. K? We should have moving average dolls. So you have different colored fuzzy little line dolls that are moving averages, and you, know, you can buy your favorite one. So we give them each names. So 10-day, we could call it something cute, or the 20-day. And of course, some would be simple, and some would be exponential. Uh, the exponential would have a lot more fur on them. So that, that was my thinking for a moving average doll. What do you think? Are you in? <laughs> Well, it's a it's a unique idea, so I support it on that basis. Uh, but but you could also have dolls that describe different chart uh, personalities. You know, like, yeah, like you could do that. The base on base doll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I personally would like the double bottom, but that's you know. The double totally bottom doll. That, that's the one. That, that one sold on RealDoll.com. So, anyways, um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Generac is just hanging out. You had a breakout holding along with 10-day. Looks okay. You know, volume picked up yesterday, uh, but you get some support off the 10-day line, so it looks okay. Nothing wrong here. It looks fine. Splunk, you demand. Somebody says, "Well, if if it goes higher, I am." So you know, I'm I'm in the stock. I I bought the pullback yesterday. It was looking pretty grim, down closer to 68 between 68 69 and. Uh, and once it started to turn uh, on the day, it's getting a little more aggressive there. Now you you got some overhead to work through, so it might back and fill a little bit and then cruise higher. So DDD uh, DDD looks okay to me. It's you got a little pullback here. You're getting a little cup with handle. The volume is drying out. I wouldn't be surprised to see this thing uh, turn around. And for those of you who use the 620 chart, uh, I'd keep an eye on that because it might. Uh, it might, I'm looking at it right now. It's actually looking like a possibly it's it's testing the lows. Let's take a look at this. Um, Dr. K, gunfight at the OK Corral there. Uh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, all right. I'm trying to get. Pull up the style template here for the. Here we go. And let's make this thing uh, float. 
So let's look at 3D intraday. Five minute. Pull this down. Here's your pullback. Uh, you're coming, you're undercutting this low. A lot of times stocks will stop here. Uh, watch the turn here you have on the MACD. It, it looks to me like, you know, as they're coming down, the MACD's lines are getting really deep here and then not so deep here. And now in this pullback, they're starting to turn to the upside. So it seems to argue for a uh, potential, you know, turn in, this, in the stock here. And it's acting okay. Uh, <clears throat> on the pullback. It may pull back a little more though, so. But it looks okay, you know. Anyways, let's see. More questions. I like, this is an interesting question. Um, I don't understand how you are having a best year. The VMAP C is having a so-so year. Uh, and that's true. The VMAP sees use a pyramiding strategy, which is much different than the way I've traded. And if you're paying any attention to what I say on these webinars, I've adopted a completely different method and not pyramiding schemes. And it's a very active uh, method. And, it, and there can be 3 to 5 uh, to 10 percent drawdowns regularly. And I know this particular person asking the question would freak out if we were down 10 percent in one month. But you know, I think that you have to pay attention to what I'm saying and the fact that uh, pyramiding doesn't work. And so to get our VMAP-C program working again, we're going to have to shift the way we, we do things. Anyways, Dr. K, you have any comments there? Yeah, I mean, it's, pyramiding is, is generally a great concept, but uh, it works very well, but this is a very unusual market environment we're in. I mean, this is, ex this is the, I mean, I haven't seen the market like this in, in decades. That's completely no. Manipulated and motivated by quantitative easing, so it's gonna it's gonna behave differently naturally, and it explains also why the the trend following wizards are collectively down for the year, despite the averages being up well into the double digits. Um, I don't think there's no. In fact, there has never ever been that kind of um, a, a de deviation between the trend following wizards' performance and the market, because they they're known for beating the markets. Right. Um, you know, and then people look at the charts and they'll say, wait a minute, it looks like the market's been in a pretty consistent uptrend. It looks pretty easy. Well, it looks pretty easy, but it's actually one of the most challenging uptrends uh, that we've ever seen because it just comes back enough to, to get the uh, these systems back into cash, and then uh, and then they start moving higher again, and these systems have to go in and buy late. Yeah. Buy back late. Yeah. Nickel and dime, nickel and dimed, and, and when all is said and done, you know, a lot of these trend-following wizards that have, have exceptionally track records earning money for other people, they're down, you know, 10, 20 percent or more. Right. And, you know, it's always interesting to me how people don't listen to what you're saying. And even though I've explained like a million times that pyramiding system does not work well in this market. And you have to be very active and take an aggressive stance of buying strong and big positions into pullbacks, having the guts to do that, and then allowing for some leeway on the downside. Because you might get pushed uh, 5, 10 percent, as I said. But then as they turn and go higher and, and they run up, then you sell into that. But the key is, you know, you buy, let's, let's talk about this because I think this is a good topic. You know, you buy a 10% position in something and it runs up 50%. Well, guess what? You made, a, you made a 5%. If it runs up 20%, wow, you made 2%. And then you start averaging up, but then the thing cracks on you. Now you're underwater on, say, a 20 or 30% position and you're getting whacked. You know, so my, my advice to most of you, if you're trying to use a timid, you know, buy 10% here, buy 10% there strategy, I think you need to shift it and maybe ramp your positions up to 20% or more and, and try to get on board there because uh, I notice, you know, if, I, if I'm aggressive and I buy them right and in size off the lows, uh, any, for any drawdown I have, you know, buying into a pullback like that, the turn gets me back to the upside very quickly. So, but again, you know, I'm just astounded that someone can ask a question like that uh, which tells me they're not listening to what you're saying. That what they really have in mind is uh, what they have in their in, when, in their own mind, and they're not open to what you're saying and trying to understand what you're saying. And, uh, and but you know that's pretty pretty common. Anyways, move along. I think it's easy to get emotional too when someone else is doing better than than you are. And and you know I can I understand the uh, how how the uh, thought process could work on that and, and lead the person to ask the wrong 
question because they uh, have been led to the wrong conclusion. Well, also they're just not listening to what you're saying to them. You know, well, they're not. They're, they might be that listening. It's very irritating. You know, it is me. irritating, but it's also like I can understand <laughs> the trace back. There's an emotional quality that they, actually that person should deal with because that's going to affect their trading as well when they're trading their own money. I agree with you. I agree. Right. So, but in any case. Uh, I think uh, if you're using a parameting strategy, you've got to start shifting, and I think this year has shown that that's the case. But the, you know, there are ways to deal with it, and I think there is going to be a huge opportunity in the market going forward for a basic <laughs> parameting strategy. This just may not be it, and you've got to be very aggressive. The other thing to keep in mind is I do a lot of shorting as well, so that makes a big difference. But you know, if you're using a little common sense and you understand how Gil trades in his own account. Since I do just talk about it all the time on these webinars, you know, uh, you would know that I'm also shorting a lot of stocks aggressively, and there have been some great uh, short sale ideas, actually. Anyways, <clears throat> somebody says they're just asking about Xerox because it was on your screen at the start of the webinar. I was surprised you were looking at it. I'm just looking at a screen on stocks down on volume, and it just happened to be that. Uh, Xerox was one of those stocks down on volume. If you look at it, and so that's why. Just because it's on my screen doesn't mean anything. I know everybody thinks I have a magic screen and everything on it. You know, somehow seeing my screen is going to help you make money. Let's see, uh, Forest Labs, nice move up. You know, just for me a little flag volume drying up. Nothing else going on. ONVO, you know, I've been looking at this one because you're getting a, you got the pullback, it looks pretty ugly, and uh, notice how it's holding tight along this level. Now, some of you might be familiar with, you know, Neil's square box uh, base formation, and he came up with that, I think, about a year and a half or so ago. And I, my feeling is what, what that is, is this sort of thing I'm, I'm uh, looking at too, but I call it a roundabout, and it's something like, say, an ACAB. For example, here, you know, come down, you form a tight uh, low of a base here, and you try to turn around and come up. And uh, and so you basically, this is a roundabout sort of thing. You know, we picked up the pocket here on ACAD, but that's the sort of a thing, a square box that he talks about, where you have a break to the downside, sideways move, and then a move back uh, to the upside. And then you're buying the stock and a breakout from the square box. I would prefer to be coming into things. Uh, as they're rounding out and forming pocket pivots. So that, that brings you to um, Organovo, which is uh, holding tight along the 10 day. And so you're in a position, let's see, one, one, two, three, four, five. Here's a 10th day away. So today you'd have to exceed that on a pocket pivot, but you know maybe you do a five day pocket pivot and buy a little bit with the idea of holding it here along uh, you know along the 10 day and the 20 day and assuming that it's going to hold the lows anyways CUDA I like the, I like the symbol CUDA is uh, what is that Dr. K you got any any take on this thing what is it just checking now actually I haven't heard of this one uh, but it looks like they're computer software security they uh, yeah they're security um, help it's yeah, they help the customers protect and store their data delivered um, as a cloud connected uh, uh, to appliances and virtual appliances. So it looks interesting. The, uh, it's not earning anything, but it's bound to earn uh, in 2014. The yeah, uh, revenues are coming along, but uh, not not very explosive either. I don't know. It's uh, it's one to watch. Maybe I'll put it on my watch list. But uh, yeah, I think so. You know, yeah, put it on your watches. It's kind of thin though, and yeah, you're losing money. They're supposed to make seven cents next year, but you know, it could be like a work day. One of those sorts of situations. So, yeah. Let's see. Um, CBI. This ended up on my. Actually, I'll show you guys something here. This is my action list for the day. So every night I go through my uh, HGS Investor software and I come up with an action list of stocks that I'm keeping an eye, a close eye on. And uh, CBI ended up on it. Uh, let's see. Whoops. And it's it's uh, let's see this is it's trying to round out here. Uh, this is a MSCI index adjustment, right, Dr. K? On this day, that's why you see a lot of stocks last week had some heavy volume. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, you got a sort of trying to 
flash a pocket pivot here and and turning you know making a turn so it's looking okay and if you look at this you're basically your first pullback to the 10 week moving line since the breakout so that that looks okay <coughs> somebody's asking uh, have we started running strategy D yet in the manager caps no we haven't and uh, but we're only taking large investors who number one aren't whiners and can deal with uh, an account that trades like my account uh, if you recall, I ran a fund at one time, and you know my trading 20, 30 percent drawdowns are not unusual. And uh, you know, people, while well, one person in particular freaked out, you know, after there was a 20 percent drawdown, because supposedly you're supposed to be able to make 11,000 percent without ever having a single drawdown, and uh, you know that was the experience. And my so my feeling is the only way uh, we could ever accept anyone to program D, which would emulate my own account, uh, would uh, would be if number one the amount that they invest is very small, relatively small uh, relative to their total uh, investable assets. So if they were going to invest a million dollars, I'd like to see them have at least ten to fifteen million in investable assets. And because otherwise, you know, if you're running money for people and like fools, they give you they allocate a bunch of money to you, thinking that you're going to make them rich enough to buy a small island somewhere. That's just greed talking, and it's hard to deal with the emotions of people who are, are like that, you know. Uh, so, you know, the program D is uh, is there, but we're only, I'm only accepting certain people in, into that, uh, and not just anybody. Five, eh, pulling down to the 50-day. So after this breakout, first pull back into the. 10 week actually 50 day but I don't know that one that stock's been a little erratic BLMN Bloomin Brands another failed breakout not a stock I've liked and I'm, I'm gonna try and explain why let's see BLMN I mean retail restaurants I don't know it doesn't get me excited and you've seen the group pretty weak as well you know noodles getting shellacked CMG uh, Chipotle's been acting okay though. Uh, let's see. Luckily, I bought the 1025 13 pocket pivot from BLMN. Yeah, I mean, that's. Uh, where is it, right? Yeah, see, and this is how if you get in earlier, it saves you from you know getting whacked on the breakout. So it shows how pocket pivots. Uh, work let's see <laughs> here's one for you this is from uh, our friend uh, JT Chris okay great I remember John from anyways here's John's question dr. K have you used your exceptional research acumen I mean do, do you have to underplay it so much John uh, to find a biotech doing exceptional work which could be a huge earning list winner survey says yeah, well, that's uh, certainly a big part of the price volume action um, because some of these biotechs have biotechs have the best story in the world, and um, they uh, unfortunately they're uh, they're too small and they don't go anywhere, and it's pointless in, in getting involved in those um, because your money's just going to sit um, at best. Meanwhile, you've got stocks, the bigger ones, higher quality names that aren't earning anything yet, but they've got a great uh, uh, drug pipeline. And so it's important to pay attention to the price volume, most of all, with these biotechs. Um, of course, with a backdrop of amazing, you know, great fundamental story, because those are the companies that are going to lead. So it comes back to buy the leaders, buy the price, and the leaders that are uh, ahead of the market fundamentally and technically. You know, that's the same formula applies to these. Uh, as far as guessing which ones are going to have the next big thing. Um, that's a really long shot, uh, and your time's better spent just focusing on finding the uh, the leaders um, with those characteristics. Yeah, I I know what John really wants you to tell you, tell him. He wants you to tell him that this one is going to be the next hot big one, and so is this one, Cephade and Isis. John, these these are your stocks. Just uh, keep buying them. Clearly, they're going to be the next earning list winners. So they're already doing okay as it is. I mean, Isis, he had a nice 
trend line breakout from a base that you know you might say is not a proper double bottom because you get uh, a low here, but but on a closing basis it, it has undercut uh, this low here, you know. So you know in this market though this might work because it's just a base. It might just just be a flat kind of base, uh, although not really. But you know it's holding tight in here and it comes up, so that looks okay. And Cephate, I think we reported on the uh, viable gap up, so and it seems to be. Uh, Holding up there pretty nicely. So but there you go, John. Those are your. Um, ah, getting a. Uh, I am yes, from uh, Jeff. Jeff, uh, well Jeff Scott. The, uh, viable. <laughs> Jeff Scott says, George and I thank you for the plug. There, guys, I know from uh, High Growth Stock Investor. Uh, had a great dinner at that Greek restaurant in Manhattan Beach, Jeff. That was awesome. Some, uh, and I should point out, Jeff has a lovely wife, and it looks like the two of us both go for brunettes, so petite brunettes, I might add. But in any case, uh, George Roberts is the one who owns the HGS Investor software, and, and Jeff, you're thanking me for the plug, but you know what? It's not a plug because it's what I'm using right now to make money in this market, and it's working. And you know, my approach has had to be a little less than orthodox here. But that's kind of been the you know the nature of the market and the nature of a QE environment. But a lot of the things that we're looking at, you pick them up off the lows. And I noticed uh, I was working with Ron Brown, who also works with HGSI, and uh, they put out a uh, a chart view that is the chart I've been using or a version of the chart that I've been using recently. And uh, you know I think that that's kind of what the market's all about is figuring out what's working, figuring out what isn't working, and then adjusting. And I can do that because, number one, I'm very flexible. And I would also say when you're trading your own money, you don't have to listen to anybody whine at you about what you're doing and need you to explain every little trade that you're doing. You can just act freely and without uh, you know, worrying about it and testing things out. And when they work, it's, it's a nice uh, feeling to get a handle on the market. So, but it doesn't take away the fact that this is still a difficult market. <clears throat> and I'm not really going to discuss my HGSI screening. There's nothing magic about it. Uh, J.C. Penny. <clears throat> hmm, hmm. Uh, I don't know. That's just a dog. I think at this point it's uh, not something Yeah, let me do this. How's that? Somebody didn't like the uh, the background, but uh, anyways, J.C. Penny breaking down. It's a dog, and not. Any, I mean, obviously, you won't buy it. I don't think I'd short it though. Um, let's see. Any other questions? It's eight forty-eight. We got another ten minutes or so. So just kind of looking around at what's happening in the market. We got uh, Facebook pulling in, so volume's lighter today, I believe. Let's see. Oops. Let's get something over here. Yeah, it's 18. So that looks normal. So you might get a little pullback in here, back and fill. So still watching that. LinkedIn holding up as well. Might things might be dormant until uh, either. Well, maybe we'll see how we close. Still really early in the day, or possibly uh, tomorrow when the jobs number comes out. But I don't think that the jobs number is going to uh, To make any uh, difference, you know, you had the the ADP number came out very strong yesterday. The market started to sell off, but it found support, and then you have the uh, some other unemployment numbers today coming out, and uh, the market's kind of hanging out, and it's you know not really breaking apart. So you know, looks like tomorrow you could be a catalyst for a rally, but we'll see. You know, just play it by ear. And be uh, be more well. Dr. K already mentioned sell gene. Uh, be more opportunistic. So even here, look at this. Pull back to the 20 day, and now it's popping out. So that looks better. You know, they look ugly one day. Okay, we get some more questions coming in. Netflix pulls back to the 10 day and is holding. That's constructive, I think. Um, a line. That's a good one to ask about, I think. It's holding along the tender. Remember, this is a company. Uh, Danaher had seven point, I think, eight million shares. They sold four point six the other day back here. 
at an arranged price. I forget what it was, 54.80 maybe, something like that. And the stock, you know, that spooks everybody. It stocks backed and filled up a little bit. It's holding above the intraday low of the gap up day here on the pullback. And uh, volume is drying up. So, you know, this is because of a white coffee and retest sort of thing. You have one here and one here. Each time the volume dries up a little bit more. So to me, it looks like it might it might want to turn here. So I keep an eye on this. I've been watching this and kind of looking looking uh, at this closely. Let's see. No, I don't use the mark indicators. So Gale, another R. Oh, that's a oh, four dollar stock. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to play yet. BBY is a short. No, I'm not shorting anything right now. Alexion, I like Alexion. The pullback to the 20 day seems to keep holding. You know, you're in a base, it's getting tight along the top here on the weekly chart, and, and you kind of got, see, here's this, I don't know, square box with a handle type thing. I don't know. But that's kind of what this looks like. And so you're looking for a breakout to pop right through the top there and see if that happens. So, anyways, let's see. Uh, Illumina. Illumina looks okay, it's pretty tight. I'm going to show you guys something. I'm going to pull this up. Here's my uh, secret weapon bar chart. So they, they just put this stuff. You know, let's look at like 3D. Uh, you come down hard, and you're for. When I, I have these bongos, I, I think they sound really cool. Kahunas, uh, up and down, whatever. Force index, 13 day, exponential, uh, 2 day. And I want, look at these bars, and I'm very visual. And so what I'll do is I'll fly through these things. And when I start to see things uh, perk up and everything turns blue again, then it's telling me you might be near a bottom. So let's look at some stocks here. Illumina, that's what you're, it, it's looking a little better here, and, and this has stayed pretty blue. And that to me, that's looking, based on the tight action here, looking like it wants to uh, hang. And it's, it's just pretty tight today, down 28 cents. So this is updated as of yesterday. Uh, let's see, I'm going to look at some other ones on here. Cores, uh, same thing. You notice you got a pullback coming into the 20-day exponential, and, and you're looking fairly blue here. This daily bongo is turning red, but the weekly bongo, I believe, uh, is is uh, more relevant. But you see, what what I've done is I've just played with this, and I like the fact that it allows you to put all these things along the top. And so I move through very quickly, and I look at charts not only. Uh, you know, it, I, I don't look at them in detail necessarily all the time. Part of the time what I'm doing is I'm flying through a, a lot of charts and I'm getting a, a sense of what a lot of things are looking like. And, and this is just more colors. And what helps with, with my eye is the, just the colors and, and seeing patterns in the colors and things changing. And that's how I operate. Um, and it's a pretty simple way of, of you know, operating. And I have to admit that when I left O'Neill and got involved with hedge funds and you know, the, the prime brokers, they've got all these gizmos for you to be looking at, and all kinds of research, and all kinds of noise. And uh, you get bogged down in that. And uh, more recently, I've just been getting back to being myself, which is a flexible trader who adapts to what I'm seeing in the market. And you know, I, I did going back to this idea of adapting to change in the market and, and going out you know going outside the box I don't operate within a tight little box so, so you know that's why in 2001 I was able to capitalize on Lockheed Martin which was not a canceling stock but it, it had a huge price move during that period and it kept going higher even after the market topped back in 2000 and we talk about this in the newest book uh, and I think that's really what what it's all about and so you know looking at some of these names um, well, let's look at NUS. It had a pocket pivot yesterday, and it's uh, today. See, it doesn't have today's action. It's ha hanging tight in here, so it looks okay if you look at it. Let's, let's bring this down here. You can see that's what it's doing today. But this has been very helpful to me in terms of uh, interpreting. Like here's ACAD on the turn here, and you notice just as it's turning here, here you get this kahuna. That's a baby kahuna, I guess. And uh, it's this blue bar, and you see how it's turning here. And then before it, it has a pocket pivot, it starts to flash more blue, and it's looking better. And so I'm putting it together with that. I'm putting it together with the weekly chart. Um, where I'm looking at the lows. You know, here's like I was saying earlier, this could be a square box. And you notice how you have the tight 
you know, that looks constructive. But you know, but that's how this whole market is. And so you know, and someone asked us this, the question about why our, our VMAP C program, which is a very rote uh, pyramiding strategy, isn't doing so well. That's that's because you know you'd be buying into strength here and averaging up, averaging up, and then boom, you get hammered. And we've seen that happen too many times. The other thing that the market does here is they'll pull stocks will pull back on you. And I don't know if this is was your experience to actually hit any point this year, but I would find I'd set a stop and that, that would basically be a low. You know, you get stopped out of something and then it would that would be a low and it would turn around and go higher. That's been very, very standard for this year, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, so what you do instead is as the stocks are coming into these levels where you might have set your stops, I'm looking at buying them. Uh, and and just shifting my tactics, you know, in, in a big way. You know. But the problem is if you're if you're running a program uh, for people, and uh, you you do something like that, then then you get the emails. You know, well, why did you buy the stock? It wasn't breaking out. You know, and, and it's like so. You, it's like people. The difficult part about writing money for people is you just get people who are just whiners, and and they really need to settle down and understand that there's a problem in dealing with the market, and sometimes it takes a little time to deal with it, and you have to adjust, and that that might take a little bit of time. You know, I go back to. Uh, 98, 99, and uh, I remember 98 when I was running money. I talk about this all the time. I was up 45 percent in the first quarter at O'Neill, and then by the end of the third quarter, I was down 32. That was like a what, 76 percent U-turn on that one. But by the end of the year, I was up uh, 82 percent. So you know, that, it took me like, three months to get things back on track. And a lot of times, you'll flounder around and drop a few percent, and then all of a sudden, boom, you catch a few things. And uh, you're making money I mean, in a big way, and I think so. You know, speaking to trading psychology, you really have to uh, stay positive. And I see it on the chat room. People get frustrated. It's easy to get frustrated, you know, especially when things aren't going as well as you expect them to. But you really have to stay positive. Well, what did you say yesterday, Chris, about something about pessimists don't are unable to see? What was? Yeah, psych psychologists have found that um, this is nothing. This is not new news. And they're just proving about the uh, law of attraction, about being positive. But they found that pessim pessimists are wallowing in their negativity and often miss the opportunities that are right in front of their eyes, where the optimists continue to look for that opportunity, so are going to be more likely to see it and capitalize on it. Yeah, and I like you know I, I like to think that both of us were optimists, and when we're going through difficulties, we remain op uh, optimistic, and that's what always allows you to come back. So you know, if you start failing and you start getting mired in it and, and down in the mouth, then you won't come back because your own your own attitude, your own energy, negative energy is going to drag you further down. So I think that's really the key. Anyways, um, <laughs> Dr. K, please share insight into international plays for 2014. I didn't. Don't you write some newsletter about hot international stocks for 2014 somewhere? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, if there's anything hot that's international, it'll be traded um, on the U.S. exchange, and we can capitalize that through uh, ADRs. Yeah, I like, uh, let's see, what do I like? I focused on uh, anything international. I mean, if it's, the U.S. has the luxury that if it's, if it's big, if it's, if it's uh, viable, then it will list on a U.S. exchange because that's the most, these are still the most respected exchanges in the world. Yeah, so you can, you know, how about EJ? I like EJ. Didn't I talk about this one uh on this pullback, I forget. There's an international play, but you know the other thing is you can't tell in advance what's going to be the hot stocks. I mean, if I had told you a year ago that one of the biggest moving stocks and one of the best stocks to just like load it, load into your account and sit with forever uh, was going to be Tesla, what would you have thought? Or Solar City, you know, a money losing solar stock. You probably would have thought I was nuts. So, anyways, let's see. Silica trendline breakout. Well, I guess you know this. I don't. I don't know if, if there's any trend line breakout in here. I tried to break out here, but it's just a uh, little pocket pivot type attempt at a move higher. You're extended from the ten day, but it looks to me like uh, it was trying to go higher and break out. So, anyways, a couple more question. International. I. You know, again, um, I wouldn't worry about international trends or what trends we see because. I don't really invest on the basis of some idea that there's a trend next year that's going to develop. I don't have, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a good enough crystal ball. Maybe Dr. K does, but somehow I just, I, that's just not my approach. You know, you have to be completely open to whatever's happening in real time. And if you get mired in some 
analysis of where international trends are, uh, then I, you know, I guess as that could uh, cause you to miss something because you're going to be closed-minded or, or oriented, you know, in one direction and one direction only. You know, if you think, uh, what's an international trend that's pretty hot right now? Dr. International K. trends. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll see it on the chart if 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 it's there. You know, it'll become obvious. <laughs> But you know, if it's hot, if it's international trend, um, again, you know, the everything's so connected that uh, you know it will. We we usually become aware of it um, just focused on U.S. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, an international trend taser is going to. Uh, oh, let's look at taser on here. So, you know, a little bit red, getting a little red. This this thing here though uh, can be an, an oversold indicator. It was here. And so I just noticed that in this market, that when you start to get a couple, three of these, by the third one in a base, it's usually a low. And so uh, that's that's another way that I'm using this uh, when I see patterns, you know, things that, that are occurring over and over again. I just pick them up subconsciously, I guess. Wet F, is it still viable based on previous pocket pivot? There's your pocket pivot there. It's way extended. So no, not on the basis of that. I mean, it's trying to break out. You're pulling into the 10-day. If you want to use a 10-day as your stop, you know, that's 1472. You could step in here if you really like the stop. Um, cell phones are trendy. They remain trendy. Yeah, I think, you know, Facebook then is going to be the hot international play. They're going international. I hear soon they're going to have Martians on their site too. But to me, Facebook is rounding out a base. <laughs> the FD here. You know, it all turned blue yesterday, so all of a sudden everything, boom, turns blue. And this is actually a, a not a baby kahuna, but a big kahuna, a grown-up kahuna, I guess. Um, but, you know, again, getting back to this, uh, you know, Jeff Scott's uh, thanking me for the plug, but it's not a plug. And I pay for my own software, and I, I told uh, George uh, last time I was that I don't want them giving me a free one because I think nothing would be cheesier than endorsing a product that just because someone gives it to you for free and I use it so I'm being sincere about it and it helps um, I just hope they don't go out of business which has always been my fear about the O'Neill organization that uh, when Bill's gone I don't know exactly what sort of secession plan they have but my understanding was from when I was there there really isn't one um, but there are some smart people there so hopefully you know, they keep things going um, anyways, do we have any more comments? I think that's pretty much it. So you kind of know where, where I stand. Uh, I, I'm I'm bullish here, and you know the index is Dow's off 30. I, what I'm seeing here, okay, Nasdaq down 0 0.13, 0 0.14 right now. Dow's down 0.20. It's trying to come back. SP, but these all went down more than the Nasdaq. And again, the main thing here is that we're observing that the Tech L is holding uh, tight here. Um. And, and this on a relative basis, so it's, it's very subtle. And yeah, I could be wrong, but what it looks like to me, and I'm going to play it this way, and I'm using the pullbacks to buy stocks. You know, I like stocks like Workday is cruising higher now, up a buck twenty. I think Splunk looks okay. I think Taser could make a turn. Tesla, even LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, GoGo looks good. Uh, the the uh, gaming stocks, NXPI is another one. I like some of the biotechs, Alexion, Biogen, uh, Watch uh, Regeneron. For a pocket pivot, you know, just you got the pullback. It's trying to hold. Notice it's trying to hold the 65-day exponential, the black line. And now you're watching this to see if it starts to turn. And this is where you want to come in, because if it does start to turn out of here, or you could buy it here using this as your low, uh, you're going to be a little early in the game, and it'll it'll get you going good once you break out, because the breakouts, you know, they don't always follow through. And that's really been the problem for pyramiding strategies in 2013. So, you know, hopefully it changes. Uh, but again, we, when we run money, first we experiment on our own accounts, and then we try to apply that on a broader basis to manage money. But uh, that's been difficult uh, in 2013, and hopefully 2014 is a little better. It would be great if the economy got very strong, QE disappeared, and then we could just start trading again based on the the old rules, but I, you know things look okay here. So I'm bullish, and uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to the VIX. Someone's asking the lad. Uh, 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 
our last question about the VIX. So I don't know. You got any last questions on the? Do you, Dr. K? I don't myself. I don't look at the VIX uh, as uh, telling me what to do with individual stocks. I just look at individual stocks. Dr. K, do you? I'll let you finish off with that. Right. Yeah. I mean, the VIX is just a backdrop for um, the uh, UVXY model, but it, the UVXY model is not, not actually using the VIX. Um, to gauge its uh, buy and sell signals, so it's just it's just sort of a background uh, general general guide to see where uh, you know where the volatility is at, and um, you know as you'll notice on the VIX pattern that it, when it goes straight up, it generally will come straight back down, and uh, so it can, it's used as a backdrop, and that's it because um, the actual volatility uh, plays that are profitable are involve using you know things like the UVXY, XIV, VXX. And uh, using uh, various uh, proprietary um, uh, technical points um, that uh, that should uh, over the cycles be profitable. Yeah. So okay. Anyways, I think that's all uh, all we've got. So um, somebody asked about who would be the best replacement for Bill O'Neill. Um, well, I would vote for Dr. K myself. I would vote for Gil. I think both of us uh, would be. Uh, yeah. But a, barring, you know what? I think Lee, in terms of brains behind the operation, I think Lee Freestone is probably the best trader there. Uh, Mike Webster, also a very smart young guy. Uh, and then there's always Two Point Charlie, uh, Charles Harris, who uh, did two well. Two Point Yeah, and, and it, Char, uh, Charles did well during like 2000, 2001, because he would buy stocks that were down. And then flip them real quick. So sort of a mini version of what what I do now in this environment. Uh, but yeah, you know, hopefully things are going to change, and we'll see what happens. But you know, we're we're varying our tactics in real time, and uh, hopefully we're helping you guys get some insight into how to vary a little bit um, in this in this tough environment. So, anyways, you guys, uh, take care. Oh, Crocs, Crocs coming in. I don't like Crocs. It's a croc. No, I don't even think I shorted here. Like I said, buy taser. That's you know that looks to me like you know a good position here. Anyways, and a few other things we talked about. That's all I've got, you guys. Thanks for showing up as always. We'll catch you next week or sooner if uh, if I feel inspired to do a shorter webinar during the day. But I just want to point out that I I thought about this and I I don't want to hit you with too much noise. I kind of think that a once a week you know run through in detail on a key day. Uh, is probably best, and, and I'm trying to you know weigh what I would want to say in a short webinar with greater frequency. Uh, you know, in addition to the one that we do, the full hour one we do normally. Anyways, um, that's all we got. We'll catch you guys next time. Have a great trading day. Later. So long.